review. A strategic plan encompasses goals, objectives, and strategies, and they're included for your review. Staff will be pleased to discuss them at your discretion. The plan also includes recommended business incentives and a technology zone designation for city and EDA properties, both of which will be covered in our presentation this evening. As a first step to engage the plan, staff recommends that all existing and future city and EDA parcels should have current surveys and preliminary wetlands assessments to allow for proper development planning and to make the properties as readily marketable as possible for prospective businesses. It's also recommended that review and revision of current zoning on city and EDA commercial properties in the business corridor and big woods be considered, enhancing property marketability and maximizing the potential for highest and best use development. Marketing strategies should include a focus on Pocosin's unparalleled quality of life and its compelling proximity to key technical facilities such as NASA Langley and Jefferson Lab. Efforts should also be made to include detailed survey and wetlands assessment information as applicable. The city should consider the development and implementation of a competitive business incentive plan. Though the incentive plan must protect the city's investment, it should also be developed with significant benefits in mind for the potential business in order to positively impact a decision to locate within Pocosin. Among the business incentives recommended are a one-time $200 reimbursement check delivered by a representative of the Economic Development Office to new businesses locating in a non-residential property. Though the reimbursement is a small sum, it fosters immediate goodwill and allows the city to gain familiarity with the new business venture. Additionally, it is recommended that the city, in coordination with the Economic Development Authority, consider owner financing or deferred payment for selected undeveloped property. In the current economic environment, Pocosin is competing with a large number of Hampton Roads localities who have business space vacancies. Since the cost of acquiring and developing property from the ground up is much higher than renting, this will not only encourage viable business investment within the city, but will also help the new business in the early years as it will have more cash or less debt to handle emergencies. Staff recommends that liability details concerning breach of contract or default should be discussed with the city attorney before a protocol of this type is developed. At this time, I'll ask Economic Development Intern Trey Brundage to present details of the proposed technology zone. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thank you, Mayor Hunt and members of council for the opportunity to present this evening. First, let's go over the reasons for establishing a technology zone. The technology zone is important for Pocosin to establish because it concretely defines and enacts the city's marketing strategy to the Hampton Roads area. It announces to the business community that Pocosin is willing and able to assist proper business development within city boundaries. It details the city's vision and action for economic growth. And best of all, the technology zone designation will enhance rather than compete with existing Pocosin businesses. Overall, the technology zone is the best chance for Pocosin to use its best assets to achieve the most important economic development objectives. There are numerous city advantages that come with developing a technology zone. It is recommended that the technology zone be enacted via an overlay district. This will allow the city to create the technology zone without rezoning all potential properties involved. The technology zone will identify Pocosin's technology-oriented marketing niche <coughs> advance Pocosin's quality of life through high-quality job promotion, provide Pocosin access to special technology zone marketing initiatives on the state level, increase visibility throughout the Hampton Roads business community, and design an economic synergy with federally funded NASA Langley. NASA can provide the project opportunities, and Pocosin can provide the space for work. Reasons for effectiveness. The technology zone is viable for Pocosin because of Pocosin's proximity to NASA Langley, which creates about $840 million of economic activity and 7,500 jobs for Hampton Roads in 2009 alone. This number is growing faster than the national growth rate. NASA's heavy utilization of private contractors. In fact, NASA employs an equal amount of full-time staff and contractors. That number in 2009 was 1,900 of each. Pocosin could serve as a work pace for either group. 
NASA's long-term growth is predicted to be much higher than the overall economy and is supported by both political parties. Special state marketing media, which promotes locality technology zones with state marketing dollars and state resources. Pocosin's highly educated workforce, which could gain employment via the technology zone. Pocosin's high quality of life and low crime rate add to the city's attractiveness for high dollar research and development facilities with technology related industries. And Pocosin's proximity to other governmentally funded application centers, such as Langley Air Force Base, Newport News Shipyard, and Norfolk Naval Base that would add to the business opportunities for a technology firm in the area. It is also important to consider maximizing Pocosin's available commercial property with highest and best use principles in mind. A technology zone could be very appealing for firms with special building requirements such as wet lab space, aeronautical requirements, and others. Getting into the, what exactly defines a qualifying technology business. The slide uh, labeled Technology Zone Business Specifications lists a recommendation for defining a qualifying technology business. The Economic Development Office recommends that a business must meet at least one of the following definitions. An Economic Development Coordinator would decide whether an applying business qualifies for the designation. The definitions are aspired directly from the Technology Zone Ordinance in Caroline County, Virginia and provide Bacosin with a very broad definition to work with at the Economic Development Coordinator's discretion. Minimum Technology Zone Business Requirements. It is important to know that the listed requirements are better minimums for a firm to receive special incentives via the Technology Zone program. And there are two major requirements for the Technology Zone, employment requirements and dollar requirements. For employment, it is recommended the minimum number be five starting employees with $65,600 average salary or 1.5 times the median income of Picosin. It's very important to reach these numbers because it makes the project eligible for the Virginia Governor's Incentive Fund, which would give us additional incentive opportunities to bring a business to the area. It's also important to note that our office recommends that there be some sort of employment or salary growth recommendation by the fifth year. As for investment requirements, there should be a $50,000 technology investment or a $500,000 capital investment of which 500,000 square, 5,000 square feet must be owner occupied if a person is developing a new building. Technology zone incentives. The Economic Development Office recommends the city take a time sensitive and fiscal approach for technology zone incentives starting with a streamlined application process for targeted industries. By properly coordinating the efforts of the Economic Development Office with other departments, the city can streamline its application and review process. This will allow a business to start developing property within the city in the shortest amount of time possible. Once an Economic Development Office is established and properly staffed, the following guidelines are recommended for a soup to nuts review process for targeted industry projects. First, the Economic Development Office should serve as the initial point of contact for all targeted industry applicants. Once contacted by a business, the Economic Development Office will send inquiry information to the Zoning Administrator, Community Development Director, and Building Official. Step two, the Economic Development Coordinator would evaluate the proposed business plan and determine if it is in fact a qualifying technology business. Step three, prior to application submission, a final a meeting will occur between the prospective business, the Economic Development Office, the Community Development Coordinator, and the Development Review Committee to review the application process with the respective business. Finally, the Economic Development Coordinator will closely track the progress of the application and ensure prompt turnaround and address any problems as they arise. However, there are also financially motivated incentives within the technology zone. In fact, the technology zone is characterized by business incentives. Locally, only Newport News and Suffolk have a competitive technology zone. Newport News offers a business license and tax abatement of 50% for 10 years. Suffolk offers a 50% reduction in business license tax and a 50% reduction in personal property tax for one year. We recommend a modified combination of the Newport News and Suffolk incentive structure. Business license tax, real estate tax, and business tangible property tax should be adjusted. The Economic Development Office recommends up to a 50% reduction of these taxes for up to five years, judged on a case-by-case -case basis. This is a maximum recommendation and actual incentives will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis following a positive Hampton Roads Economic Development Authority sponsored five-year return on investment analysis. I thank Mayor Hunt and City Council for their time and will now pass the presentation back to Dave for conclusion.
Thank you, Trey. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge Trey's great assistance and hard work on the strategic plan. It could not have been prepared without his efforts. Finally, and of paramount importance for the strategic plan's engagement, is the personnel requirement proposed for consideration. With a full-time economic development coordinator, there will be dedicated focus on the implementation of the strategic plan. I liken the plan to a football playbook, one designed to give economic development the greatest chance to win. However, the playbook has little value without a quarterback to execute the plays in it. A full-time economic development coordinator is the quarterback needed for this playbook. This person will execute its plays and strategies, and the ED coordinator pushes the strategic plan football across the goal line of economic development success. As the included resource timeline indicates, a full-time ED coordinator would increase projected staff time for economic development five-fold. The ED coordinator will increase support for the existing business community and will have available time to attend national and international marketing missions, strengthening the city's working relationship with economic development organizations at both the regional and state level. In short, the ED coordinator will quarterback the strategic plan in the economic development office every game all season long. A dedicated position of this nature is needed to fully engage the strategic plan. This concludes our presentation, and we thank you for your time this evening and, and welcome questions. Dave and Trey, thanks for putting this uh, presentation together. Um, thank you also for leading the uh, business development analysis update that was recently presented to us. Uh, we have a couple tools here uh, between the two and some thoughts that I think that we can build on to go out and help our city. Uh, I know a lot of us have talked about it for years since we were candidates on the stump about uh, helping to get business to the city of Pocosin. Pocosin has several disadvantages, uh, one of which is we're at the end of the road location. However, as you point out, we have very positive things as well, location uh, to NASA, the education of our workforce, the uh, people that we have here as well. You know, the, this is a city of, of great folks. So to bring your business here, uh, it, it, just, it just seems like a win-win. Um, I would tell you, I, I agree, and I'll, I guess I'll kind of talk first, I agree uh, wholeheartedly that we've got to do something as far as the economic development position uh, if we're going to be serious about it. Uh, if we're not going to be serious about it, then uh, we're basically going to get what we get, which is a restaurant will show up and we'll play, replace another restaurant uh, because there, there will be too many. Uh, or another business. We're looking for the niche of what we've got. This brings to light uh, the one thing I would like to do is continue in the, the frame that we are now until uh, we get through the budget season because we have a lot of unknowns as a council. Um, and then I would propose to council that we visit this position back uh, after the budget is over. Uh, see where our unappropriated fund balance is, uh, give us some time to think about our how we'll fund this position in the future uh, instead of trying to insert it in a mere two and a half weeks or so before you bring us one. So that's all I've got. Anybody else? Yeah. Questions? Yeah, I, 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 got, I, I guess three, and I think you're right, uh, Gene. If we're serious about you know doing economic development, we got to find a person to do it full time. I mean, we can't look to Dave to do parks and recreation and economic development and go in the seafood festival. In the seafood festival and the other <laughs> stuff and beating the drum. I mean, uh, right. you know, and we and like uh, I think somebody pointed out last uh, meeting that it can't. Randy, maybe it was that you can't have like a, uh, a new person do it or a part-time person. It's got to be somebody who's familiar with the area and the businesses and whatever else. And, you know, um, we got to, you know, if we're going to do it, we got to get do it. Um, the um, booklet that was prepared by, um, was it Vaughn? Yes, sir, the land use study, yes, sir. Have you briefed the PBA on that? Yes, sir. We forwarded a copy to Kathy Abel Nelson for distribution and dissemination to the uh, 
to the PBA, which was what she requested. You haven't talked personally to them. Um, I've talked to Kathy, but, but I haven't met with the group yet. I intend to meet with them at their upcoming monthly meeting in April. Because Kathy found it confusing. Which I don't, I mean, I, you know, the other night she mentioned it to me that, you know, it was just, you know, you know, you know 40 pages of stuff. Yes, sir. That she wanted to know. Um, the only other question was, do you really see NASA growing? Um, in this environment, it's talking to, uh, we, we got information from Steve Cook, who, um, on the state level, and then uh, I actually know some people in NASA as well. Right now, due to the budget situation, NASA is it's kind of stagnant at this point. Yeah. But their projections for 2012, um, due to what Obama has asked for, uh, shows them growing at, uh, by I think, $100 million from what I saw. Um, and she from there. I was surprised when you said that because you know we've heard over the years you know the NASA you know they can move the entire you know facility out of this area into you know into California or up to uh, Maryland or wherever. Yeah, they are moving them. Um, actually, I have a little information here. Um, they're actually they're doing something called I think it is it's something phase two. Um, they're actually revitalizing a lot of the. Uh, the center's over there. It's uh, just if council will give me one second to find the information. It's the phase two, Newtown. Yes, um, they're calling it Newtown Phase Two, and what they're doing is they're because the infrastructure over there is very old. I mean, the, this is the stuff that you know we sent the first people to the moon. You know, some of the equipment was used for that. Um, they're actually they're starting to revamp that, and I think that NASA. Well, the gist that I've gotten is NASA as a whole has recognized that this facility has been declining. So I think that they're putting some more money into that. Of course, that's all contingent on, you know, national budget things, so we don't, we don't really know. But, the um, continuing resolution. That keeps yeah. Going. <laughs> yes. That keeps going on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> From week to week. Huh? That's exactly From right. week to week. Week to week, month yeah. to month. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But, mm -hmm. Appreciate it, Trey. Dave, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, on your uh, second page of your slides, uh, bottom right slide, minimum technology zone business requirement. Mm -hmm. That technology or the investment requirements, is yes. that sign somewhere else in here? Or can the investment, uh, what defines a technology investment? Yeah. Um, that is not, excuse me, sorry about that. That is not at this point. Um, it would be, Basically, we were working on it, and it's. We didn't want to have it so narrowly defined that. Basically, we wanted to have synergy with the actual definition we use and the, what defines like a technology investment. Basically, um, a firm would come in and, you know, would have all this information. Here's my business plan, and then the economic development coordinator would look at that business plan, decide whether it's a technology business, and then. If it's, a te if it's a technology business, that $50,000 would qualify, basically. That's, that's the direction we were aiming for. Okay. That answers your question. We have a business here that is technology-oriented. Mm -hmm. Are they doing... Are they, excuse me? Are they they're doing well. I mean, if, if they were to move, they would qualify for, the, for this um, $50,000? Um, Dave, why don't you they, take this one? Yeah. Sure. Or perhaps um, the, I will. Uh, if, they, if they move from one part of the city to another, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, if they were moving from outside the city as a new business or new to our city, they would. And with respect to how the business is doing, they've had some changes recently to their local office, but I, they're, they're doing very well. Yeah, you know, I know that, but, but they wouldn't qualify if they moved into a brand new building. Because they're, in, they're, because already, they're in the, already here. They're already in the city. So. Unless they were doing a, a drastic evolution of their business model. Let's say going from five people to 500, we may discount the five and give them full credit for the 495. The, um, the technology zone, as recommended, um, would give the economic development coordinator discretionary latitude and in interpretation with the guidance of the city manager as, as to what qualifies specifically in the technology zone. Um, and the definitions as listed in the PowerPoint and, and the plan, um, I think are deliberately broad-based to give you 
um, not such a narrow focus that you wouldn't exclude, for instance, a manufacturing business that would have a technology slant to it. Um, so I think the technology zone, as defined in the recommendation, I think it's, it's broad-based to allow the, uh, the city, if you will, to interpret if the technology zone was the proper place for that business. And it can have a manufacturing component. This, this would allow um, development of not just a narrowly focused technology business, but again, one that has types of uh, technical manufacturing involved in the process. So um, I think the way it's defined would be beneficial for the city. Since, since this is on TV, when you're saying about a zone for technology, mm -hmm. are you talking about a certain area of, of the city? Would you explain that? Certainly. We, um, we would think that the, the zone we would recommend for consideration, the big woods and possibly some adjacent retail areas of the city for the technology zone focus. Um, as Trey mentioned in his comments, um, it, it may not be necessary for council should they choose to take that action. It might not be necessary to rezone property, but rather, and I would defer to the community development director on this point, but perhaps to consider an overlay district which would allow present zoning uh, to be maintained, but would make the zoning eligible for technology incentivization. In other words, we would just put an overlay district over top of what's already here and focus and determine, and if council was of that mind and determined that the designation, this is the technology zone area. Um, and that leads us to another point that our understanding at the state level is that if council were to consider it, council makes that decision um, it's not required any blessing from the state, so to speak. We would notify the state with the requisite incentives that council would approve, um, but that is an action that would be up to council to take regarding the designation of the technology zone. We could use, like, the other side of uh, City Hall Avenue coming yes, in. Yes, sir. Very for, much for so, that. indeed. In fact, I think that would be a prime example of where a technology zone would work very well. So basically, the zones we have today are uh, R&D, Mm -hmm. um, village commercial and business. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting, at least what I hear, that we just overlay on all three of those. I, th I think that would probably be the, the most user-friendly, if you will. And again, I, I would defer to the community development director for their particulars on that. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, I think perhaps that lends us the best advantages of both worlds. It allows the uh, properties to maintain their present designation, but allows the um, qualifying business opportunity for incentivization at council's discretion. Dave, how did you arrive at the uh, <clears throat> salary range for economic development coordinator? I see it's from 39.3 to 54. Yes, sir. Um, I've met with, uh, with the assistant city manager and with the city manager, and they provided uh, excellent guidance on what the position might fall in as far as responsibility. Um, and so we, we had finally decided, I think, with, with obviously input from, from both, that um, something along the level of a city planner would, would be the appropriate identification. And uh, certainly I deferred to, to them for comment about it as well. But, well. but we were looking for an opportunity to start. Let me go ahead and do that, if I could. I'm sorry. Let me throw my pen at you. That's okay. Um. <laughs> Do you want to make a point? There were, <laughs> <laughs> there were multiple ways to do this, Mr. Green. One way is to think about the kind of person that brings in the door all the requisite skills and track records and uh, education and contacts in this region. That person's not going to be available to us at anywhere close to this amount of money. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't think so. Uh, that is more than likely a six-figure salary, and we don't have too many of those in this city. Uh, the other option was to get someone with at least minimal experience in the field and train them up, which is more the Pocosin model. Uh, so we're, we're budget conscious, um, and we think that by focusing on a relatively small number of powerful strategies as opposed to uh, a whole bunch of them, that between Dave and myself and whoever else's assistance we can get in other localities, we can, uh, we can help build them. I think that's the term I use with the mayor. We can, uh, we can help build this person into what we need because we can't afford to buy them pre-made. Do some of our neighbors already have this, Economic development this type problems? of person? And they're making the six figures number or the? The larger department, the larger localities 
all have, you correct me if I get any of this wrong, all have rather robust economic development right. programs yeah. with multiple people and extensive budgets, and the people at the top of those are making in that salary range. But you know, we have been very good at, um, long use the word, stealing people from uh, York <laughs> County, <laughs> Gloucester, whatever, who are maybe not making the the robust, uh, you know, six-figure incomes, right. but have you know are well aware of business opportunities, and maybe you know you're not going to keep them for you know entire lifetime, but you could get them for here for three or four years to have them you know, build a resume. I agree. As, as, and. Yeah. I think that's exactly right, Frank. The, uh, at least from my perspective, you know, a lot of this position is going to be personality driven. Yeah. It's going to take a person who is out there, who's, who's forward, you know, forward thinking, as well as not afraid to approach. Um, it's, it's a special person, and they come young and old. Some come with more contacts than others. But, oh, yeah. but aggressiveness can come from any age. And, you know, I, I think we'll find that if they're successful, uh, we get one or two before they, they go into greener pastures, it'll be kind of like a lot of our departments. But I don't think that we can fund the, the higher ranging position unless we can prove the return on investment. I think we've got to start somewhere. Oh, yeah, I then, agree. I agree. Then, then and, I think, build. and I think that's where you get them. Like, like Buddy said, you get them from, you know, you know from... Bigger, bigger departments are where the guys are looking, or the, or the women are looking the opportunity. to, to, the, the, opportunity looking to the opportunity to move out and, um, yeah, build on a resume. Mm -hmm. we, we're not talking about building a building for somebody in technology, are we? Um, not as it's presently uh, recommended, but we're... Okay. That, no. Okay. <laughs> well, let me let me caution. We have a nine-story nine building going up. That <laughs> let me caution you guys as you as you think about it in the next few weeks. Tying down incentives, okay. These may be your base incentives, but tying down incentives just means that you you're constantly uh, coming back and saying, yeah, but this one is slightly different than that one. Um, these may be great bases, but the real thing for council is, do the numbers work? You know, if you can prove that the business will be profitable to our tax base, that it will bring the employees to the city that will support our other businesses, all of those things kind of have to come into consideration. I would never, and I think we've all made this pretty public, we're not going to go buy your business, you know. But some of the things that you talked about here are certainly doable, like financing from the EDA, uh, that's certainly a doable thing because they have a line of credit <clears throat> and they have the property to make the loan on. So actually that kind of protects the city from in certain regards. Well, yeah, and I, and I think Dave and, and Trey and Randy know but better than I do, this is a tough, tough sell market. this time of year. I mean, we or this time of recession, whatever, mm -hmm. where other communities have a lot of vacant, you know, properties that are, you know, they're trying, they're begging people for. I agree with you, Mr. Ruger. We've got a lot working against us, and, but my feeling is if we're ever going to get a significantly more than we have now, we've got to, we've go got to put it. in, we've got to get in the game, because with all the disadvantages that you just noted and the fact that we're competing with others that have better highway access, vacant property, and a a name that's known outside this region more so than ours, uh, you know, forgive me, but putting a sign and hoping that they drive to the end of the road and notice it, it hasn't worked so far. Yeah. And so we really need to reconcile our expectations with our resource plan. And, and, I, and I heard you all loud and clear in my conversations with you over two years, economic development is really important to this city, not just for new stuff, but to help stabilize our existing businesses. Yeah. All of this money that uh, the, the study showed a couple of weeks ago was leaving the city to be spent elsewhere. Anything we can do to create a positive speed bump effect so that you, they spend their money here is a good thing. Oh, yeah. and, but we really don't have the resources to pull off much. We're doing the best we can. When Dave we is the best <coughs> zero resource economic development director in Virginia Barna. Well, I think Trey did a pretty good job. Yeah. Well, he got Trey. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> when we uh, had Dana Dickens, was it, here a few yes. months ago, I think we pleaded with him not to ignore Pocosin. Yes. Has, it, <laughs> Has that worked out yet? Has it worked out yet? <laughs> no, sir, it hasn't worked out yet, but he heard you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, mean, I hope so. I mean, it's not you are contributing a dollar or two to... I think, I think what Dave hit on is the, the you've got to go out there. They're not going to bring it here. We've got to go out there and get it. And if we can find the person that can do that uh, after the budget season, then uh, and after we see what we can re uh, adequately return, then we'll, I think we should consider that. Yeah, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago talking to uh, one of the Browns, and the other areas for economic development, they had like a, like a bus ride through their various areas. And I don't know what it cost. I mean, I have no idea. Was it like $5,000 or whatever else? And, I think it was Brad Brown said, you, know, you ought to jump at something like that and bring these, these people out here to you know, Pocosin and see what you got available. And I don't, you know, uh, it's money. I mean, it's, it all comes down to, you know, how do we want to spend it, I guess. Anybody else have any questions? I had a question. Where I know you mentioned you'd like to talk about the, the budget part after, after our budget, but am I reading it correctly that... The budget is eighty-three thousand. The uh, the budget figure cited there is exclusively for the strategic plan engagement. Um, operational costs for an economic development office would be additional costs. Right. But we we put that there so that you would understand the specific cost of engaging an additional person okay. and the resources that would need to be utilized in order to engage the plan. Right. And just off the top of my head, eighty-three thousand is about half of a penny in the tax rate. Okay. A little bit more. It's also about a school teacher and a half. You need to keep that. <laughs> right, right. I'm good. good. Oh, did you got anything? No. Yes, no, no, no. Okay. Mr. Mayor, you also wanted to take this opportunity this evening to speak with the council a little bit about the TD TMDL issue as it moves forward. And, yes. and Ellen Roberts, our engineer, is here to lead us in that conversation. It's appropriate? Absolutely. And uh, as, as Ellen comes up, let me kind of brief the council. Went to uh, the HRPDC meeting uh, last week. Um, and the TMDL uh, discussion is obviously the biggest topic uh, on the HRPDC, specifically what we've all heard about, about stormwater drainage. Um, prompted me to do a lot, of, a lot of looking into it. I'll tell you that uh, the EPA's website, uh, led me to a lot of lot of valuable information, um, and we'll talk a little bit about it after we talk about the, the cost of this. Uh, but I wanted Alan to come because we have a decision to make on possibly as early as this Thursday, and I need to make sure that council understands what I will be voting on as far as the TMDL limits at the HRPDC meeting. It's a special meeting on Thursday. And they're trying to decide their course on their legal standing on uh, action against the EPA, as well as, you know, trying to get a firmer understanding of what TMDL means to the cities. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as Mayor Hunt mentioned, on Thursday there's going to be a special meeting of the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission on whether or not to take legal action against the EPA over the TMDL. Uh, the city attorney and the city manager and I attended some preliminary informational sessions um, the early part of this year, and Mayor Hunt discussed or heard some presentations at the last commission meeting. Um, so the city attorney will have some information on the legalities that maybe they don't really teach you in engineering school. Um, the main point I wanted to make tonight is that when you read about the issue of legal action against the EPA on this program, um, when you hear about it in, in the paper or on TV, you hear a lo lot of talk about whether or not the HRPDC and its members want to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. That's not the question. I think everybody is for a clean bay. The question is whether or not the EPA program is the best way to clean the bay whether it was developed using good science 
um, whether the EPA has the legal authority to implement the schedule that it wants to implement for the program, and also did the EPA follow due process when getting the program started. Uh, there are many technical issues, but just to talk about a couple, one of the big things, components of the program is the Chesapeake Bay model which is a suite of computer programs that basically are being used to develop pollutant requirement or removal requirements and to monitor progress of the program once it's, it gets underway. There are, there's a lot of information out there that seems to indicate that the model is flawed. The EPA itself ha acknowledges that the land use data that was input into the model in developing the first um, publication in the Federal Register was indeed flawed and they're currently rerunning the model using new land use data. I've had a chance to look at Bacosin's data that's being input in this new model. Um, I have some issues with it, but that's something that if we proceed with the program as it is now, we're going to have to straighten out in the first couple of years because right now they're going with what they have. Um, in Picosin, in addition to that land use data um, concern, there's some concerns about whether or not the EPA is really taking into account the impact of living in a coastal community. Uh, are they really, I haven't found a lot of evidence that they're thinking about how tidal waters interact with stormwater in coastal communities. Uh, right now we're put in the James River watershed. Picosin doesn't drain to the James River. There is the potential that we will be allocated pollutant removal requirements based on a river that we don't drain to, we didn't pollute, and we can't clean up, no matter how much we do. Obviously, that's a concern, then we're, we're going to have to watch that very closely. The Clean Water Act is the basis for the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. There's a question as to whether or not the Clean, whether or not the clean Water Act gives the EPA the authority to impose deadlines for cleanup, whether or not they have the right to say that we have to have our, all our cleanup measures in place by this year. Um, that's something that's a, a legal issue. Uh, finally, in recent months, we learned that the EPA has already started allocating waste loads to specific cities within the state of Virginia. The problem with this is if you look at what was um, provided on the EPA website, they talk about how the EPA is, was going to allocate waste load re pollutant remo removal requirements to specific large river watersheds. And then the states were going to come in and split those up among smaller rivers and streams and by municipalities. <coughs> in Virginia, and in Virginia only, the EPA, ha EPA has gone ahead and developed waste load allocations for large cities and has started writing that into the stormwater permits. So that does two things. It takes away the state's rights to figure out how to allocate the pollutant loads and also kind of speeds up the requirements for those large cities who suddenly have numbers instead of waiting a year for the state to finish their work. There are four possible legal actions. There's always the no action course, which means we're just keep doing what the EPA is proposing we're doing. Um, HRPDC could consider filing in a brief, and I'm going to ask the city attorney for the proper term here, term here as an interested party for the Farm Bureau. Um, Case up in Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, you could file a brief with them. Become a, an interested party, like, in fact, an interpleader type of thing. Okay. That's coming from Pennsylvania? It's a case already filed in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, where Pennsylvania has challenged one one aspect of EPA's position. Yeah, the Farm Bureau, the American Farm Bureau, and the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Farm Bureau are the parties in that suit. Um, for a limited scope, it's just for one phase of the EPA's mandate, as I recall. Yeah. Right. Um, they, we could, the HRPDC could file suit on all or some of the issues that are being raised or they could reserve the right to take legal action in the future. Um, one of the questions that will be um, discussed in the session on Thursday is what's the, what are the chances of winning each particular issue and what will that really accomplish in terms of um, this program? Will it stop it? Will it slow it down? Or will we just keep proceeding 
with what we're doing now, even if we do win. Um, legal action cost at this point um, depend on what action is what option is taken and how the fees are distributed through the region. I haven't been party to those conversations, so um, I, I don't think that's been decided yet. Currently, our cost estimate for the program itself to the city of Pocosin is between two and three million dollars a year for 15 years. I'm sorry, say that one more time. It's two to three million. Um, that's what it looks like now, just, as an, just to give you another update. Um, it's going up from a million, hasn't it? Wasn't that a million? It started at six, then it came it's down six, to um, teachers, isn't it? six. It, it's gone <laughs> to six. At one point, it went to one to two. I think two to three is probably per year. Per year. What we asked for for the capital improvement plan or what we marked in the budget was one million with the idea that maybe some would be done by private um, redevelopers and some we could. Um, we weren't budgeting the whole amount in the CIP. I think our, I think we, our real problem is we don't exactly know. Right. At this you point, know, it is all so preliminary. But again, how, two to three for how many possible years? Fifteen. But the problem is that does not take into account any <clears throat> condemnation or land acquisition. That is the cost to run the program. They, they excluded from those estimates if, for example, we have to, as a city, impose water runoff and we have to go buy land to mm -hmm. put a pond on, a holding facility, whatever, none of that is included in that 2 or $3 million a year. That yeah. is just simply operating expenses. That, is, I right. the that, we that is physically the cost to put it in the ground. And I that think, is not I, the I think cost it's important for council to understand that, that <clears throat> this would be across the board. So this is kind of a way of backfitting uh, these right. uh, new, you know, yeah. the ponds are all required now of a new development or whatever it's in the cost. Uh, because it's affecting the city's discharge permit, uh, those limits would have to take into account all of our roads. So we may well find ourselves having to backfit these type of structures into existing neighborhoods. And this, you know, not, you know, you know we're concerned, but this could bankrupt our neighboring communities and cities and, and counties. Definitely a, For, a I mean, tall order. If we're going 2.3 million, I mean, your county is probably Yes. Well, that's yep. <laughs> six, seven, eight. I don't have the figures. No, much higher than that. That oh. actually, I think. Um, I don't have the figures in front of me, but um, they were presented. If you go back through, if you still have the information sheets from the November yeah. uh, 2010 presentation, you'll see some earlier numbers. If you cut them in half, that's about what the estimate would be now. Um, we are probably one of the least expensive uh, municipalities. Is now I do have. And wasn't wasn't uh, and in November wasn't didn't Hampton's number begin with a B? Mm -hmm. Now if it's half of that, Virginia. it's only half right. of a B, but a billion rather than million. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sense of how big that number was. Mm -hmm. Basically, this program will change the way localities all through the Chesapeake Bay watershed um, operate. It will change how um, development occurs within the entire watershed, which is 64,000 square miles. In your presentation in November, you said that some of the states were, were fighting it, like New York. Was it New York and New Jersey? They were at the time, but they have... Um, Lost interest? <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm really surprised. I expected to hear more after the TMDL was published, and um, they're really... I mean, there are sporadic parts of different states where people are are objecting to the program cost, but in general, there isn't. Um, there aren't a lot of lawsuits. The Farm Bureau lawsuit is really the only one at this point. Here's here's kind of like because <clears throat> I know we're we're going right. to run our, out of limited time, but I gave you all a couple of examples. Number one, I think the mayors and, and chairs. I hear it there. I hear it at the HRPDC that first and foremost, we are not against cleaning up the bay. Uh, we are also not against spending money to clean up the bay. In fact, uh, because we've already invoked the Chesapeake Bay Act on this side of 95, that we're, I think uh, the numbers by the EPA website are we are 65% implemented. Okay, So we have BMPs, we have these things that 
that basically do that. So what are the results of that? And that's why I kind of gave you these two handouts, okay? One is this first handout just basically shows you what all the states are that drain to the, the that's the drainage region, region to the Chesapeake Bay. And the second part is, are you effective? Okay, and we just heard Wayne talk about Pennsylvania. Well, I, I didn't get this in color for y'all, but this is sediment coming down the bay. This was taken last week after the March storms and the snow melt. This is sediment coming down the James River. Okay, if you look around the tidal areas of where we are, look at all the coastline and you'll see bright, bright clear water. So are we effective, or, I mean, are the measures that we're doing effective? And I would say that we are effective a whole lot more than Pennsylvania is. Yeah. You know, but, you, know you got to wonder if the state had acted earlier, say, west of uh, 95, also affected the Chesapeake Bay, and they took their responsibility for farms out there and whatever else and those kind of things, whether we'd be in a lot better shape today well, I don't, I mean, and I, don't I think that, and I think that's a way that the state can approach it and maybe appease EPA I think <laughs> our biggest thing is EPA is big government okay not right wrong or indifferent they're just they're large there's 17,000 people uh, that don't know a lot about particulars in a particular area just as you talked about tidal flooding uh, or, or tidal <clears throat> water they don't understand that our results would be would basically be flawed by the fact that we have inflow and outflow of the already uh, Chesapeake Bay water. So how do you separate what we're putting in versus what we're receiving uh, from that perspective? I think our biggest thing is we just want to sit down with them and have those conversations. You know, we, these are the things we're doing. These are the things we're recommending. Uh, you know, so that there could be a two-way street. This sounds like it's just a mandate and it's a mandate that's really not solving the two big problems that I see, which are the North Bay and coming down from inland Virginia uh, above Richmond. One of the things that they did when this first started, this, the state DEQ negotiated with, with uh, EPA to take over some of this responsibility. And so they began the process, but apparently, uh, and I don't, I'm not inside of any of it, but apparently at some point in time, EPA decided that the state wasn't being stringent enough or wasn't being forceful enough and sort of took back some of what they had said they were going to let the state do. And that's why we got mm -hmm. where I was talking about now, where now EPA's come back and said, well, the state's not going to designate these or we're going to do it. So I don't really know what's going on. It's, pretty much above my head politically to know what, what the different agencies are doing. But, I mean, EPA's approach is going to be they're going to cram it down your throat. Right. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's why we find ourselves in this illogical position of, of a locality taking on, or a, a series of localities taking on the EPA. But government doesn't sue government. It's just, it's just not right. Everybody in the Hampton Roads on the south side are on the same page for this? Well, if, they had the meeting that... I'm not speaking for the city manager, but he and Ellen and I went there, and they basically went through a scenario. The, they had the uh, there's an attorney who is at the uh, Richmond who he's followed this all along, and he sort of represented uh, all the jurisdictions. And within that, he basically outlined those issues that he thought you could successfully uh, go to court on, and those that you couldn't. And he gave sort of an analysis of where to go and. To take, I think it was four different, you may remember, but I do, but I think it was like, there were four areas to be challenged. And to challenge those four areas was going to cost a half a million dollars, a minimum half a million dollars in legal fees. And not all four of them had a high probability of being successful. And so he gave you again you know, some idea and gave you sort of a number for each one of those four. Obviously, if you, if you pick the four, then you don't get a, a lineal reduction in what the cost are, you understand. Because if you only pick two of the four, it doesn't mean the cost will be 250 The cost may still be 375 But all of these four options weren't high, uh, 
possibility of success. I think there were two of them. Yes. The, one, um, one of them he gave the highest possibility, and I don't have my don't notes with me. And then there was okay. a second one that he 20%. said had a reasonable probability, but the other two he wasn't mm -hmm. very strong about. But half a million is a heck of a lot better than the billions it's going to cost well, the collective but, cities. But the question, like Gene said, the question is going to be, are you going to win the battle and lose the war? Because if you, if you say EPA didn't give you due process, okay, so we spent a half a million dollars to say EPA didn't give you due process. Well, what do they do? They give you due process. I mean, they just simply go back and instead of giving you 30 days in the <coughs> Federal Register, they give you six months. But then you get the same end results. That, that's the kind of thing that the attorneys would, were trying to explain, that you can, you can go to war and win this battle, but in the long run you still lose because EPA can back up and sort of fill in the gaps that they jumped over, but still get to where they are taking you. And so the idea is how do we stop them from getting where they want to go versus just sort of a skirmish that only gets us part of the battle. And I don't know. And I think the whole decision. Half a million in court course, if, if EPA decides to drag it out, could run a lot more than half a million. Absolutely. And I think one of the, the conscious decisions that, you know, and it may take a, another turn on Thursday, and it's just more of the we're going to reserve our right to do this later. I think the real goal is to bring EPA to the table, you know, um, to, to be able to have the conversations between the technical experts about what is going to make a difference and what is just one size doesn't fit all. But I think, the, like I said, the most telling thing to me is, are those pictures. And you compare that to the data that uh, we're 62% implemented by the Chesapeake Bay Act, I'm saying you're talking to the wrong group. You should be up in Pennsylvania, and that's where you're going to make the difference in the Bay. Uh, you need to be talking to down the James River in farm country, and that's where you're going to make the difference in the Bay. They said the best state a couple of years ago was Maryland. Is that Maryland is. still the best? Um, Maryland is very rigorous in their laws. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how well those laws are implemented, but the, if, if you look at the paper, they're, um, they're very rigorous. They're, uh, this is going to hit the eastern shore of Maryland and the agricultural community over there very, very hard. Just um, very hard. Wow. Well, that'd be a killer. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing with having a chance to eat input with the EPA, um, I will be listening or sitting in on a talk by the the one of the head EPA guys for this program next week. If there's anything specific you'd like me to bring up during the question and answer period, I've got a couple questions and comments of my own I intend to bring up. So, I think, um, as, I've, as I've kept saying, we should put forward, instead of taking the back seat and saying you're trying to cram us down our throat, we should say these are the things that we're doing. These are the things that we suggest can make tweaks to what we're doing to make it better. But, you know, we're far from wanting to go and backfit all of our neighborhoods and well, condemn that, houses. I, I want to answer this November. question to yeah. Wayne. Okay. Excuse me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've been trying to get this in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, I mean, Right off the bat, this really appears to be a federal government versus states' rights issues for the states along the watershed. And is there any feeling for what the state at the state level is having to say with the federal government relative to this? Because, you know, I'm one of the people who agrees with the objectives of the today. I think everybody is. Okay? But I'm concerned about the, their method, model, and their schedule. And uh, I'd much rather see EPA acting as a coordinator for the states in the watershed so that we could develop a bottoms-up approach from the states on something that we could afford and do in a, in a doable timeline rather than seeing, seeing it pan down that road. And so certainly the state has to have a position on this that we can work with. Well, but limited knowledge, I have a very that the state started off with trying to get EPA to delegate certain authority to the state. And then the state began to implement some of these things, beginning to make rules. And one of the first things that happened is like the sewer cleanup that we're, that we're dealing with now. Well, that was sort of EPA going to the state and saying, okay, well, you, you get in here and start getting the localities to come into compliance. And the state started doing that. And if you know, we're, we're, we're photographing our systems and doing these things under this EPA order to clean up our 
uh, any potential discharge of uh, wastewater in, into the from the sewer system into the state waters. And that was a, an effort by EPA to have the state sort of be the point on that. But it doesn't appear to me that the same follow through has happened in this. And I have not, I have not kept up with all this. It is meeting after meeting, as Ellen mm -hmm. will tell you, there's no way that I can possibly keep up with all these meetings. I've been to some key meetings, and that's really the ones I've been to. But it appears that where in the beginning the EPA was willing to let the state sort of be the point, I think that they have stepped back from that now. The EPA is saying, we're driving the train now. We're not going to let you drive it with, with state action. The government's going to drive it. That's the sense That's, that I get. From because they, they consider it to be a multi-state issue, I think they've decided that they have jurisdiction. Well, I understand it's a multi-state issue, but the federal government could still be a coordinator for the multi-states and let the states get together and, and, and come up with a plan from the bottoms up. Absolutely. The bottoms up plan Absolutely. work better than the tops down. Absolutely. No argument there. You're, you're right on the issue, which is what we said. Who knows best how Pocosin functions as a drainage system than Ellen, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and how to make differences in what we do, you know. And the engineers and technicians were never given the opportunity to say, here's how we can groom what we're already doing. In the meantime, there's some big ticket items that you can go out and attack, like Chesapeake Bay Act in the whole state instead of half of it. You know. If we let the states decide, it would be just like north and south back in the <laughs> 1860s. <laughs> and, uh, another confederate war. <laughs> what? For the war of the states. The states oh, where it needs to be decided. Which is the 150th anniversary. Yeah, yeah, right up. <laughs> war of northern aggression. <laughs> northern aggression. <laughs> but if y'all have any thoughts, so you go there. But the Yankees oh, yeah. won that thing. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Remember that? Uh-uh, I don't remember that. Don't remember that? Gene. <laughs>